again and welcome to another Picky Board Gamers episode. In this explanatory video we will see Whistle Mountain designed by Scott Caputo and Luke Laurie. We've recently seen another game by Luke Laurie, The Dwellings of Eldervale, which you can find if you click in the button in the top right corner. Now in Whistle Mountain players take the role of companies that are trying to exploit a very rich mountain with high profit potential by building scaffolds and machines. The game is played in one and a half hour, it's for two to four players, and let's move to the table and see how the game is played. Use the four board pieces to assemble the main board of the game and place it in the middle of the table. Use the two water towel holders and place them in the two holes on the board, then stack all the water bars and place them in the first row of the grid. After you separate the machine towels based on their size, shuffle each stack and then place each stack in their corresponding space on the board facing downwards. Then flip the top three tiles from each stack and place them in the spaces next to it. Do the same for all three stacks. Separate the scaffolds based on their shape, shuffle each stack and then place them in their corresponding spaces on the board as well. These tiles are upgrades, likewise shuffle the stack and create a face down supply in this space here and then flip again the top three tiles from the stack, placing them in these spaces on the board. This is a dedicated space for the cards of the game, shuffle all the cards and place them facing downwards here and this is a space for cards that are discarded. Next to the board create a supply with the main resources of the game, we have water, iron, coal and gold. There is also a fifth resource, whistles. Whistles is also a wild resource and can be used instead of any other resource when needed by the player. Also create a supply with the victory point stars and place the duplicator token next to the board as well. These are award tiles that will be placed on this tower. First, separate the four rescue tokens that should be placed in the bottom level of the tower then shuffle the rest awards and place one award on each level of the tower. Players then choose one of the colors and get the personal board and the game components of the corresponding color. Players have three airships which they initially place in the docks on their personal board. This here is the barracks. Players place one of their workers on each level of the barracks and the last two workers are placed in the whirlpool. The central part of their board acts as a player aid as well as a storage where they will be placing their resources. Now players need to choose a random player to be the first player. For our example, this is the yellow player. The rest follow in a clockwise manner. All players start the game with a water, an iron, a gold and a coal resource. However, the second player gets an extra water, the third player gains an extra whistle and if there was a fourth player, he would start the game with both an extra whistle and an extra water. These here are ability tiles. Shuffle them and then randomly choose one for each player plus one more tile. The rest of the tiles are removed and go back in the box. Now, starting with the last player and moving anti-clockwisely, players take these tiles, choose one of them and then pass the rest to the next player. Now, the first player who chooses last keeps one of the tiles and returns the last one in the box. After players choose their ability tiles, they place them in this recession of their boards. Starting ability tiles as well as other tiles in the game offer various effects and bonuses that of course I'm unable to explain all of them in this video. However, in the rulebook you will find reference appendices that explain thoroughly each one of these effects. I didn't find any difficulty understanding all of these, however if you have trouble, please let me know. Now players choose two scaffolds. Starting with the first player and moving clockwisely, each player selects one of the scaffold stacks and get the top two tiles. Players must now place one of the two scaffolds on the grid. The only rule is that at least one of the scaffold squares must touch the bottom row. The second scaffold is placed in the player's personal supply next to his board. In the game, players take turns starting with the first player and the rest follow in a clockwise order. This happens indefinitely until the end of the game is triggered. And when is that? As soon as there is no worker in the barracks. On his turn, a player has two main options. Either to take a collect turn, which involves placing one of his airships either on the grid or in one of these recessions around the board and collect 
cards, upgrades, scaffolds, machines and resources of course, bringing them on his player board or take a Ford's turn which involves taking all his airships back from the board and performing build actions, adding machines and scaffolds he acquired to the board and also move around one of his workers. Besides the main action, the player may also perform a couple of bonus actions which will be explained at the end of this video. For now, let's see the first main action collect in more depth. With the collect action, the player places one of his available airships on his player board to either on the grid or in one of these recessions and if he doesn't have any airship available then he may not perform the collect action. Let's start with placing the airship on the grid first. In order to demonstrate better examples I have added some scaffolds and machines on the grid. When the airship is placed on the grid there are two options either to be placed entirely over empty grid squares or entirely over empty squares of one machine. The airship may never be placed on a scaffold square, it cannot exceed the boundaries of one machine and of course it may not be placed on a square used by other airships or cross the boundaries of the grid. Depending on where the airship is placed, the player activates all its surroundings. These could be machines or resources found on scaffolds or water bars. Machines provide various bonuses like gaining resources or other rule change mechanisms when they're being activated. So if the yellow player placed his airship like that, he would activate all three machines as well as this resource on the scaffold. When each machine is activated, it grants the player all the depicted bonuses. So in that case, from wet gold, the player would gain a water and a gold resource. From black pointer, he would gain a coal and the victory point and from the Tesla coil machine the player could spend one iron to get one award from the supply. Also the player will collect one coal that is depicted on the scaffold. When a player gains resources he places them in his storage. As the illustration suggests a player may never exceed four resources of a specific type at the end of his turn. The player may exceed this limit during his turn, but at the end of his turn he must discard resources to conform with the limit. I will now switch positioning of the yellow airship so you can see how it affects the bonuses collected by the player. Alternatively, the player may dock his airship in one of these docking areas around the board. In such a case, the size of the airship is not important. What is important is that the docking location must be empty and if there is a cost associated, the player must be able to pay it. All the docking locations on the left side of the board relate in acquiring one machine tiles from the board and placing it next to the player's personal board. There are two docking locations for acquiring a small machine costing two or three coal respectively. There is one location for acquiring a medium machine that costs three iron and a docking location for a large machine that costs three iron and two coal. As soon as the player selects the machine, the empty space is automatically refilled from the stack with a new tile. When this location is used, the player gains one card from the stack. The player can spend one resource to get two cards or two resources to get three cards. The type of resources is not relevant. The player keeps his cards secret from other players, but the number of cards he has is open information for all players. Last but not least, if a player needs to draw a card and the stack is depleted, the discards are reshuffled to form a new deck, from which the player may draw the rest of the cards. In this docking location, the player acquires one upgrade tile, which he places in one of the six upgrade slots of his board that is empty. The associated cost for this action is not depicted on the board, but in the top of the tile itself. So in that case, the player must be able to spend four coal in order to obtain this tile. After the player has six upgrades, he cannot gain more and he cannot replace his existing tiles. All these tiles provide a permanent effect or an ability for the player for the rest of the game. This tile, for example, makes coal a wild resource for that player. 
that player may now use call instead of any other resource, even instead of a whistle. Again here, the empty space is immediately refilled from the stack. Finally, we have three more docking locations for players to acquire scaffolds. A player performing this action can acquire up to three scaffolds. Taking one scaffold is free. The player chooses any top tile from any one of the stacks and places it next to his player board. The player may take two tiles if he pays a whistle. Again, the tile must be the top tile from the same or any other stack. And if the player pays two whistles, he can gain three scaffolds, again the top tile from any one of the stacks. The next main action is Forge. With this action, the player returns all his airships back to his personal docks and then performs a certain amount of work actions. Players must take the Forge main action when they have placed all their airships on the board, but they can even do it earlier. A player could take two Forge main actions in consecutive turns just because he wants to perform more work actions. So what are these work actions? We have the build work action with which the player builds a scaffold or a machine onto the grid, we'll see how. And there's also the move work action with which the player moves one of his workers around. Now, each time a player takes the Forge main action, he can build up to three times and he may move up to once. He can do less, but he can never do more. This player, for example, has two acquired scaffolds and two acquired machines. So after this player returns all his airships on his personal board, he could choose to build up to three of these items on the grid. And then the player may move one of his workers. Nothing is compulsory here. The player may choose not to build at all or not move at all. Players may perform their work actions in any order they desire. So players could first perform the move action and then build or build then move and then build again. So now we'll explain how a player builds a scaffold, how a player builds a machine and how a player moves. Let's start with build work actions first. First of all, the first build action is free. The second and the third build action, however, each cost one water resource. After the player pays the costs, he places scaffolds and machines onto the grid. How you build scaffolds and machines is a bit different. Let's start with scaffold building first. Scaffolds are built on empty grid spaces. The player may rotate it or even flip it and then place it. Now take a look at my graphics. All scaffold tiles have 10 segments. When you place a scaffold, at least one of these segments must be orthogonally adjacent to another scaffold or another machine tile. Of course, the tile may not exceed the grid's boundaries and it cannot overlap anything. So placing this scaffold here is not valid. For each segment of the new tile that is attached to another scaffold or machine, the player gains one victory point. Placing the tile like that will grant the player five victory points. But if he places it like that, he would only get four victory points. Now let's see how machines are being built. First of all, the player must find a valid location to build his machine. Machines may only be built entirely over scaffold squares. No part of the machine may be built over any other type of square. Workers can also be placed on scaffold squares. Building a machine over scaffold spaces with workers beneath is absolutely allowed. However, these workers must first leave the area by being promoted to the tower levels. In our example, we will build this six square machine in this space here. Before placing the machine, these four workers must be first promoted. Workers are being promoted in player order, starting with the phasing player, the player who is placing the machine, and then the rest follow in a clockwise order. In our example, yellow player is building the machine, so he's gonna be promoting his workers first. Each worker being promoted moves to the right by following the same grid row to the corresponding tower level. If there are any awards in this level, the player chooses and gains one of them. These awards grant the player specific bonuses, but they are not activated or used at this moment. The player just keeps them next to his board for now. 
yellow player has another worker which moves to the same tower level and since there is another award available, the player gains it immediately. The next player in clockwise order is the red player. He moves to the same tower level, but there is no award left to gain. Finally, we have the blue player who moves to this tower level and gains this award. Now the scaffold area is empty and the player may place his machine. After building the machine, the player gains the victory points depicted in the top of the tile, which in this case is 12 victory points. Workers in the tower levels will remain there until the end of the game. Normally, that's the end of the process, however, take a look at this row here. Whenever any part of the new machine is built above this row, the mountain becomes more flooded and the new water tile is placed in the next row. Let us now see what happens to items that are covered by the new water tile. It is possible that the new tile covers part of any player's airship like it happens here. These players take back their airships and dock them in their personal boards. It is also possible that the new tile covers workers that are located either on a scaffold or in the barracks. All these workers are moved to the whirlpool. After removing airships and workers, the new water tile is placed like this. Very important, any machine that is partially covered with water is waterlogged and may not be used again. Airships that are still above water but on the machine remain on the machine. However, in the future, no player may place his machine on that tile and this machine may not be activated again. With a move work action, a player moves one of his workers to any scaffold square on the grid. This action costs one gold resource if the player takes his worker from another scaffold square or from his barracks. If that worker comes from the whirlpool, then the player needs to pay two gold resources to rescue him. A player may also perform bonus actions before, during or after his main action. There are two types of bonus actions, either play a card from his hand or redeem an award. As I said, a player can perform two bonus actions, however only one of each, so a player on his turn may play at max one card and redeem one award. Redeeming an award means discarding one of the player's bonuses to get the depicted award. In this case, the player will get one whistle from the supply. Cards offer players various bonuses, for example by playing this card here, the player may spend one gold resource to gain a random and free upgrade tile from the face down stack. With this one here, the player may gain a free scaffold tile from the market. After the player finishes with his main and bonus actions, game proceeds clockwisely to the next player. The game ends as soon as barracks is empty of workers, either because of flooding or because the player moves the last worker from barracks. The phasing player will finish his turn which will be his last and then all other players will take a final turn before final scoring. First of all, players gain victory points for their workers in the tower. Each worker in the tower grants the player the victory points depicted in the tower level he is located. In this example, the yellow player will gain 24 victory points. Players will also lose 5 victory points for each one of their workers in the whirlpool. Here, the yellow player will lose 15 victory points. Then, each player scores the victory points depicted on their upgrade tiles. Here, the yellow player will score 9 victory points. Then, players will score 1 victory point for every unused machine or award, for every 2 scaffolds or cards, and for every 4 resources remaining on their board. After that, the player with the most victory points is declared the winner. In case of a tie, the tied player with the highest worker in the tower wins. If there is still a tie, the tied player with the most items in storage, machines, awards, scaffolds, cards and resources will win the game. If there is still a tie, then all tied players have to agree that this is a draw or solve this with a rematch. That was the game for today, if you liked our video and want to see more, please subscribe to my channel and until next time, have fun and play more board games.